Hi everyone, and welcome to Chapter 7, The Cellular Basis of Inheritance. This is a lecture that goes hand in hand with our last lecture, Chapter 6, wherein we learned about the process of mitosis, which is how most eukaryotic cells are produced. To recap, mitosis involves a cell replicating its DNA and then undergoing a series of phases which allow it to split that DNA in half in order to create two identical cells out of the end of it, which are identical to both each other as well as the original parent cell that started the process. Cells that are made through this process called mitosis are called somatic cells. But in this lecture, we are going to be talking about the one type of cell that is not considered a somatic cell and the exception, therefore, to mitosis. But before we do that, let's take a moment and review a little bit about how mitosis works in human cells. Taking a human skin cell, for example, um, if the skin cell undergoes mitosis, how many chromosomes does the parent cell originally have? How many daughter cells are produced through the mitosis process? And how many chromosomes do each of those daughter cells have? So as I said, there is one type of cell that is produced not through mitosis because the daughter cells are not actually identical copies of the parent cell. You may have been able to predict based on the title of this chapter that the type of cell that we're talking about here are the sperm and the egg, also known as the gametes together. So these types of cells are produced through a different process than mitosis. And the reason why is because the gametes are the cells that are involved in sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction is the type of reproduction that involves two separate parents, each contributing half of the genetic information to the new offspring. This means that the gametes, the sperm and the egg, do not have a full set of chromosomes in them, Rather, they only have a half set of chromosomes, 23 instead of 46, that are found in all of your other cells. It makes sense, then, if these cells have a different set of chromosomes, or rather a smaller number of chromosomes than the rest of your cells, then mitosis will not produce them. There has to be a different process, and that process is called meiosis. Now, at this point, it's worthwhile reviewing a few terms that we introduced in the last chapter, um, but we're going to go over their definitions again here. The term diploid we introduced to describe cells that have a full double set of chromosomes. And if we're talking about humans, then that means 46 chromosomes. Haploid cells, which we introduced last chapter but we didn't talk about in detail, is the term used to describe cells that have only a half set of chromosomes instead of the full double set. In the case of humans, the haploid gametes have 23 chromosomes. So meiosis is the special type of cell reproduction that ge generates the haploid gametes. And the type of cells that undergo meiosis are actually a diploid cell called a germline cell or a primary sex cell. So the process starts out with a diploid cell, but then that diploid cell undergoes divisions that eventually reduce the chromosome content in half. One thing that makes meiosis a nice and easy follow-up to mitosis is that both of the processes involve the same basic sequence of phases. So thinking back to chapter 10, what were the names of the four phases of mitosis and what are they followed by? What comes after those four phases? So although the basic sequence of phases is the same between mitosis and meiosis, the two processes are also different in several ways. And perhaps the most important difference is that that sequence of four phases occurs two separate times over the course of meiosis. There's one division called meiosis one and a second division called meiosis two. So the result is that instead of only producing two cells from a single division, meiosis yields four separate cells 
from producing two cells and then those two cells split in half again. So we're going to walk through the steps of meiosis and for simplicity's sake, we are going to focus on an organism that only has a single set of chromosomes, which I mentioned in the last lecture, is uh, this type of ant called the jack jumper ant native to Australia. So this will allow us to see exactly what's going on with the chromosomes and we don't have to pay attention to too many chromosomes at the same time because there's only one pair that we're paying attention to. Let's take a look at what a jack jumper ant's uh, germline cells look like toward the beginning of their cell cycle process. So here's what the cell might look like before it undergoes S phase. Remember that S phase of the cell cycle is when the DNA is replicated and duplicated. So at this point in time, the chromosomes only have two arms, one big arm and one small arm. And of course, because this organism only has one pair of chromosomes, there are only two located in the nucleus here. So th this is what it looks like uh, before S phase takes place. After S phase, on the other hand, the chromosomes would look like this. Um, they would have four arms instead of two because each arm was replicated during S phase. But in reality, moving into meiosis, the nucleus would look more like this because remember, the cell doesn't waste energy keeping the chromosomes in their chromosome form. Instead, they allow them to exist as their loose DNA form, which is called chromatin. So this is what we look like headed into meiosis. And remember, there are two divisions in meiosis, and so we're going to start with the first set of divisions called meiosis 1. This means that every step in the process is going to have a name that has a number after it. So here we're talking about prophase 1, and later on we will come to prophase 2 when we do meiosis 2. So prophase 1 in many ways looks like prophase as it occurs in mitosis. During prophase, the chromatin condenses and winds into the form of chromosomes. The nuclear envelope starts to break down, and the centrioles begin to build the spindle fibers and stretch them across the cell, and that's what you can see happening in orange. But there's something different about prophase 1 that doesn't happen in either prophase 2 or regular prophase of mitosis, and that's this phenomenon called crossing over. So at the end of prophase 1, the pairs of homologous chromosomes engage in synapsis, which means that they physically pair up with each other and stick to each other along their length. They engage in this crossing over phenomenon, which is also known as genetic recombination. And what this means is that the two chromosomes, which are stuck to each other in synapsis, physically exchange chunks of DNA between one chromosome and the other. The points at which they connect with each other and exchange pieces of DNA are called chiasmata, and this can happen multiple times along the same set of chromosomes, but here we see in this example it's only happened once. So at the end of crossing over, the two chromosomes actually have some pieces of each other's DNA in them. The red chromosome or the maternal chromosome now has some of the blue or paternal chromosome and vice versa. So the mom and dad chromosomes actually swap pieces. Again, this is unique to prophase 1. This only happens during the first prophase of meiosis 1. It does not happen in mitosis and it doesn't happen in the second prophase. So after crossing over happens, the chromosomes are going to attach themselves to the spindle fibers and they are going to enter metaphase 1. Metaphase 1 looks somewhat like metaphase that you're familiar with. The chromosomes will line up at the equator of the cell. However, the one thing that is unique about metaphase 1 is that the chromosomes are still engaged in synapsis at this point, meaning that they are still stuck to each other. 
So instead of the chromosomes lining up on separate spindle fibers, in this case, the chromosomes are stuck to each other side by side, straddling this middle line here. This means that when the cell moves into anaphase one, the chromosomes themselves are going to be pulled apart out of synapsis instead of being broken down into sister chromatids. In mitosis, we saw that the centromere would break apart and the chromosomes would be physically pulled apart where one sister chromatid would go in one direction and the other one would go in the opposite direction. But in this case, the whole overall chromosome has maintains its uh, integrity here. It's still intact. The two have just been ganked out of their synapsis of being stuck together. In telophase, the chromosomes cluster at either end of the cell, and a new nuclear envelope reforms around each cluster of chromosomes. And finally, they begin to decondense back into their form of chromatin. After telophase, we have one cell that has two nuclei in it, and so it's necessary to break that overall cell into two separate cells, one with each nucleus, and that process, of course, as you know, is called cytokinesis, so that's what happens next. And that represents the end of meiosis I. So after this point, the cell is not going to stop it's going to move into meiosis II, which is where each of the two cells that we just saw engages in a second set of meiosis phases and divides one more time. So that's what we're going to walk through now. Prophase II, which is the first stage in meiosis II, involves seeing the chromatin recondense back into chromosomes and the nuclear envelope breaking down. The centrioles once again create the spindle fibers, but notably, no phenomenon known as crossing over occurs in this stage um, because the homologous chromosomes have already been separated into two separate cells here. During metaphase two, these chromosomes will line up attached to the spindle fibers along the equator of the cell. And when we move into anaphase two, now is when we see the chromosomes being pulled apart at their centromeres in the form of separate sister chromatids which are dragged to opposite ends of the cell. So here is where we see the chromosomes finally break down and in this way anaphase 2 is more similar to what we see in mitosis than anaphase 1 is. In telophase 2 the chromosomes cluster at either end of the cell the nuclear envelope reforms around them. And of course, the spindle fibers are broken down because they are no longer needed. Now we are left with two cells that each have two nuclei in them. And each of the two cells will undergo cytokinesis to form a grand total of four cells out of this process. So let's take a look back now at where we started and where we have finished here. This is the cell that we started with. It was a cell with one nucleus and it had two chromosomes in it. And notably, this is before S phase took place. This is before the DNA was duplicated. So we've got one cell with one nucleus, two chromosomes. By the end of meiosis, we have four cells, each of which has a single chromosome. And very importantly, these chromosomes are not identical to each other. In fact, no two cells in this mix are exactly the same in terms of their genetic content. So we've started with a diploid cell, and through meiosis we have yielded four haploid cells, each of which is genetically distinct because of this phenomenon called crossing over that happened, which allowed them to exchange some pieces of genetic material. So now we're on to another checkpoint here. We've talked about domestic dogs before as one of our examples, and the somatic cells, 
or normal body cells of domestic dogs have 78 chromosomes. How many chromosomes would then be found in dog gametes, dog sperm and eggs? And next, before a germline cell goes under meiosis, is that cell diploid or haploid? And then finally, are the four daughter cells that come out of meiosis too diploid or haploid? So to sort of summarize how meiosis does this, the germline cells that start off the process will inevitably duplicate their DNA as they go through interphase. During S phase, their DNA is replicated and multiplied times two. But then once the cells enter meiosis, it's cut in half, not just once, but twice, which leaves the four gametes with a half set of DNA that is necessary to engage in sexual reproduction. In this checkpoint here, I want you to describe to me the differences that you saw between the process of mitosis that we learned about in chapter 10 and the process of meiosis. And I just want to take a moment and answer a question that might be on some of your minds, which is, why does crossing over happen? Why does this phenomenon of homologous chromosomes exchanging genetic information occur in the first place? What, what good does it do? How does it benefit organisms for this thing to happen? Well, as you can see, crossing over increases genetic diversity among the gametes because that little event of taking a chunk of the maternal chromosome and swapping it with a chunk of the paternal chromosome resulted in a greater diversity in the possibilities that could be found in the chromosomes of the haploid gametes. This is one of the reasons why organisms that reproduce sexually exhibit a much greater diversity compared to asexually reproducing species like bacteria. Bacteria and other prokaryotes that reproduce through binary fission essentially clone themselves every single time they reproduce, and that doesn't create a lot of genetic diversity. For sexually reproducing organisms like humans, uh, genetic diversity is vast because their chromosomes are able to cross over, which creates a wider variety of different possible gametes that can be passed down to offspring. In this figure, you can see the effect that crossing over has on the diversity of gametes that come out of meiosis. On the left hand side, we see a cell that undergoes crossing over during the first stage of meiosis versus a cell that does not undergo crossing over during uh, the first stage of meiosis. And the cell that undergoes crossing over actually ends up with twice as many genetically distinct gametes compared to the cell that doesn't undergo crossing over. So you get two times the diversity out of this when you're talking about an organism that has four total chromosomes here. So just like things can go wrong in mitosis, and we talked about the effect of things going wrong in mitosis and it leading to cancer, things can go wrong in meiosis as well. And errors in meiosis lead to chromosomal aneuploidy, which is defined as the condition of possessing an improper number of chromosomes. This individual right here and their karyotype are an example of a chromosomal aneuploidy, because as you can see, they have three copies of chromosome 18 where they should only have two. This is caused by a failure of chromosomes to separate during anaphase of meiosis one, or a failure of sister chromatids to be pulled apart during anaphase of meiosis two. And this phenomenon of failure to separate is called non-disjunction. Here's what non-disjunction really looks like. When the chromosomes are lined up in metaphase, 
and preparing to separate, you expect that half would go in one direction and half would go in the other direction. But non-disjunction is where that doesn't happen, and instead, the whole thing gets dragged to one side or the other. This means that the cells that result from this division, one of the cells is going to have too much DNA, and the other one is going to have too little. One will have an extra copy of the chromosome, and the other one will have a missing copy of the chromosome. Now, most chromosomal aneuploidies, the, the chromosomal aneuploidies of the majority of the 46 chromosomes that are in the human genome, are fatal before birth in humans. And in fact, chromosomal aneuploidy is the most common cause of miscarriage among pregnant women. However, there are three chromosomal aneuploidies that are survivable until birth, and those three are Patau syndrome, Edward syndrome, and Down syndrome. Patau syndrome is where an individual has three copies of chromosome 13. And even though uh, people can be born with this, uh, it's, it's still a fatal disease. 80% of babies with Patau syndrome die within their first year of life. Edwards syndrome is where a uh, baby is born with three copies of 18, but this is also fatal. 50% of babies with Edwards syndrome die within their first week of life. Down syndrome, which is where an individual has three copies of chromosome number 21, is the only instance where a human can actually live functionally for many years with three copies of a chromosome. And this is the case because chromosome 21 is actually the smallest chromosome, meaning that it carries the least amount of genetic information and therefore having three copies of this chromosome has the lowest impact of any of the other autosomal chromosomes. Now, it, when it comes to talking about the sex chromosomes, the X and Y chromosomes, things are a little bit different because it's possible to have aneuploidies of these chromosomes as well. For example, having two X's and a Y together results in a condition known as Klinefelter syndrome. Having three X's is actually a normal female. Having one X and two Y's is normal male but having two Ys together is lethal. As you can see, the Y chromosome is actually much smaller than the X chromosome. Uh, it carries far less genetic information. And while you can survive on two X chromosomes, you cannot survive on two Y chromosomes. In fact, you can actually survive on just a single X chromosome. That's known as Turner syndrome, to have one X and your other sex chromosome is missing but having a single Y is also lethal. So as you can see, um, biological sex is not necessarily a black and white sort of division because there are things like Klinefelter syndrome and Turner syndrome, which represent ways of being intersex, um, not fully XY, but also not fully uh, XX. And because I've gotten this question before, I've added a slide about it and what it means to be intersex. An intersex individual is defined as someone with some combination of male and female sex chromosomes, ovaries and testicles, genitals, and or sex hormones. Klinefelter syndrome is one way to be intersex, but there are also a wide variety of other conditions that can create the, the intersex state including ovotesticular disorders of sex development. For example, if an egg is fertilized by two different sperm, or the embryos of fraternal twins that are initially two separate embryos inside of the womb, then fuse to become one, then an individual can be born with a combination of XY and XX cells in the body. And so part of their body is XX and part of their body is XY. Androgen insensitivity syndrome is uh, where an XY individual has cells that actually do not respond to testosterone and therefore they develop fully female or partially male in their sexual characteristics. Taken all together, all of these different ways to be intersex, 
doctors estimate that somewhere between 1 and 2 percent of the human population is intersex uh, in one of these various ways. So it's more common than you might expect it to be. And on a final note, we're just going to have a little brief discussion about aneuploidy and maternal age, um, because it is a reality that as women age, their germline cells undergo, undergo more non-disjunction and have more chromosomal aneuploidies. Whereas women in their 20s have approximately a 2 to 3% chance of having a child with a chromosomal aneuploidy, women in their 40s have a 30% chance of having a child with a chromosomal aneuploidy. You may know that as women get older, it, it is uh, more likely that they will have children with, for example, Down syndrome, or more likely to have uh, chromosomal aneuploidy-induced miscarriages, and this is the reason why. It's not yet known whether the correlation is the same for men. However, there is good evidence that as uh, fathers get older, they do pass down more non-chromosomal mutations, meaning mutations in the letter code of the DNA, than older mothers, specifically 80% more non-chromosomal mutations. So there is some contribution of the father's age as well. And on that note, we are finished with this lecture, and I will see you in the next one.